I keep going with uh, a series that we've been talking about called the Living the Questions in Matthew. Uh, today is week two of that. Um, they're not being disrespectful, I promise you. We're going to see something in just a minute. Uh, they have permission. Uh, so um, we, we kind of go to Jesus um, as if... Uh, all the time. This is uh, maybe you see Jesus this way. We we kind of have this idea that Jesus is sort of like a like a like a guidebook, like a like an encyclopedia, like an, uh, a field guide. Like in this situation, do this, or in case of this, do this. And we think about like the Bible and this relationship that we have with God as this like there's a cause and effect kind of thing that happens here. That's true. And God made us with brains. They might say, thank God. And, and then, like, there are those people that we wonder about, right? <laughs> Don't elbow anybody. That's not nice. Um, but God gave us brains. And, and, like, there's a lot of examples in the Bible where Jesus, instead of just giving the answer, Jesus sort of gives a question. And he invites them to kind of think about it a little bit. Or go, he'll go, hey, you know, you've heard it this way, but... What about this? Have you thought about it like this? And so that's what the whole point of this, uh, this series is over the summer is, is to kind of look at those questions that Jesus asks and kind of dig deep into those and, and see what God would have for us in that. Uh, today's uh, passage uh, comes from Matthew uh, chapter 5. And um, we're going to look at that and, and see what's going on there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about dads and a little bit about um, kind of the way we fit in this as well. And there's a really cool skit that you're going to get to see in just a little bit too. Um, this past week I dropped something on Facebook and a couple of y'all participated with me. Um, and then here's the graphic. I had you guys vote on this. So which best describes your dad when it comes to a family road trip? Um, we had about 50 folks respond back. Uh, the number one response was this one. Uh, the first one, it says, we're good. Uh, we don't need to stop and ask for directions. Yeah. Uh, we'll come back to that in just a second. Um, uh, the second most re uh, popular response was that next one, the loved one, that says, uh, this is a family trip. You tell me where you'd like to go. So you've got like, a really nice loving to have there. Um, the next most popular response was the angry response at the end, though. Um, don't make me, don't let me turn this car around, or don't make me stop this car. Um, and then the other one that received votes was uh, the ha ha one in the middle that says, um, "Quick, everybody, shut off your devices and let's sing." Or you had kind of a happy go lucky kind of dad there. Um, that fourth one received no votes, believe it or not. So dads don't care about money, and, and they're good. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That was a joke. Um, yeah, so um, we're going to kind of get into this and, and see what um, these questions that Jesus asked. And so what I want you to do is, is uh, you can look up on the screen or go with me in your Bible. Uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, verses 38 through 42. And to get at these, we have to go to the message version, uh, translation, paraphrase, to kind of see the question here. But it says this. Um, here's another old saying, Jesus says, uh, that deserves a second look. And this is the saying. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And here's the question. Is that going to get us anywhere? Here's what I propose, Jesus says. Don't hit back at all. If someone strikes you, stay in there and take it. If someone drags you into court and sues you for the shirt off your back, give the wrap your best coat and make a present of it. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit for tat stuff. Live generously. So, so here's the point of today's message just very, very simply. Revenge seeks payback, whereas generosity seeks to pay it forward. Revenge seeks payback. Generosity seeks to pay it forward. So let's talk about revenge for just a minute. You've probably heard these sayings before. Don't get mad. Get even. Right? What was that? Get glad. Somebody said that. That was good, too. Um, get even. Um, it, some of these are kind of food related. So revenge is a dish best served cold. Um, revenge is sweet and not fattening. And then William Shakespeare said this about revenge. He said... Uh, if you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? 
I want you to be honest with me today. It's usually what I ask in a, in a sermon. Um, hear this, uh, or think about these things. Do you ever feel justified when it comes to seeking revenge? Be honest. Yeah, there are those times, right? There are those moments where we, uh, we want to get someone back or we feel like someone deserves something. Maybe some of these situations you find yourself in that you feel justified in revenge. When someone cuts you off in traffic, right? There are a number of responses after that. Um, some of them are not so great. Um, when someone hurts you or, or slights you in some way, maybe if someone takes something from you, you feel justified in taking revenge. When someone one-ups you at work, you feel like you've got to show off or, or sort of get the attention of your boss again. And then what about this one? When someone pulls a prank on you. And i got a little bit of a confession for you guys. I don't like pranks. I don't, I don't like pranks. It's not that I don't like having fun. I love having fun. But I just don't like pranks. And, and here's the problem. And you've been there. When someone pranks somebody else, what's like required after that? you got to prank them back, right? And, and it has to be better. It has to be one step higher. And then when that happens, I mean, you just got to go back. And it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse until somebody has hurt somebody really bad or somebody, like, took it the wrong way or they went too far. And we've all had those situations where somebody just doesn't get it. Or you were trying to be funny and they really got hurt. Um, and you, you know, those sort of things. It's, it's not that... It's not in good fun. It's sometimes, most of the time, those things go too far and they get taken the wrong way. Um, so revenge may feel good like in the moment, but ultimately revenge chains us down. It, it shackles us and forces us to be bound and, and, and do things that we don't want to do. And some of you guys may say this, you know, I don't want revenge. I want justice. And I'm not worried about like if I get that person back, but I want them to get what they deserve. Maybe you find yourself in that. And this is exactly that point where Jesus comes in and, and says, you know what, you've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But you know what? Is that really going to get you anywhere? And it's really kind of crazy that Jesus would throw that in there and go, you know what? If you're honest, that doesn't really fix anything, does it? The issue here is that instead of getting someone back, we want somebody to get justice. Or we, we want them to get what they deserve. If they've hurt us, we want law. We want justice in the midst of that. Um, and just like revenge, the problem is, is that this sort of eye-for-eye eye thing just doesn't stop. Um, Gandhi said this, and then Martin Luther King Jr. quoted it too. He said, he said if, uh, if, if eye for an eye really happened, if, um, if we did this thing, the world would only end up blind. True, right? If we took eye for eye justice seriously, the whole world would just end up blind. And Confucius said something similar. He said, before you embark on a journey of revenge, dig two graves first. One for that person, and then you might as well dig one for you, because you're going to hurt yourself in the midst of it. And ultimately, you're going to get wrapped up in it. So this, the problem with this kind of revenge and that, that kind of justice that seeks payback is that there's no end in sight. There's no way to stop it. it ultimately, we become chained down to the person that's wronged us and, and our hurt never gets healed. Things never get fixed. And we never really experience freedom and joy, the kind of freedom that Jesus wants us to have. Here's the hope, though, is that Jesus breaks the chains of past wrongs and hurts to bring us freedom. These things... While they feel like, you know, I've got to take care of them, I've got to take matters into my own hands, and, and I've got to be the one to, like, break it and, and make, it, make it go away and, and, and force it to stop and that sort of thing. The truth is, is that the only time that real freedom happens and the only possibility of freedom occurring and us being set free is, is through Jesus. Um, the great thing is, is that it's not completely fatalist, right? It's not that there is no hope. It's that the only hope is Jesus Christ. And that kind of hope is freely offered to us. And that's an amazing thing as we, as we think about it. As Jesus would invite us into that relationship with Him. So how exactly are those chains broken? What is it that stops the cycle or prevents it or brings healing in the midst of it? The answer is very clear from the scripture. It talks about generosity being the thing that conquers revenge. 
And just right quick, I want you to see these things as a comparison between revenge and generosity. Revenge looks at the past. Generosity looks to the future. Revenge desires pain. Generosity seeks blessing. And revenge seeks payback. Whereas generosity seeks to pay it forward. True generosity leaves us speechless. And it, it, it fills us with amazing uh, things as God designed it. It touches us in a way that's powerful. Have you ever experienced this kind of generosity that Jesus talks about? Let's look at this scripture one more time. Just kind of the last part of it. As we, uh, as we get towards the end here. It says this. If someone drags you into court and sues you for the shirt off your back, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. Uh, and if someone takes you, uh, takes advantage of you, unfair advantage, use the occasion to practice the servant's life. No more tit for tat kind of stuff. Live generously. In my life, I've been touched with uh, these blessings of generosity in many ways. Uh, the first would be uh, when Tiffany and I had our kids, uh, we made the decision for me to stay home for an entire year and be a stay-at-home dad. Um, that was an amazing year in my life, but something that, that required daily moment-by-moment kind of prayer and help um, in the midst of it all. Just being honest with you guys uh, today. But there were some ladies, some older ladies at our church uh, where we were at at the time that sort of adopted me and became like other, uh, more moms and, and became grandparents for my girls. Um, and, and what would happen is every Tuesday afternoon for almost an entire year, uh, a group of ladies, it started out with three or four, and then there was one that was very faithful by the end of it that would come. And they would come every Tuesday about 1 o'clock to a little bit after lunch, right at about nap time for us. And um, they, in the early days, they, they would tell me, you know, go, go do something. And I would say, I, I just need to nap. So just, you know, I'm just going to go upstairs and, and, uh, and sleep for a little bit, if you don't mind. And, and they were good with that. Later on, after the girls were sleeping through the night, and I could sleep a little bit more at night, um, they would kick me out of the house and make me go do something. Um, and it was such a generous act for me, and, and, and that they would do that for us. Um, and it really, if it wasn't for that, it would have been a whole lot more difficult in the midst of it. Um, that's one way. Another way that um, I experienced generosity was in Nicaragua, and it continues to be one of those things for me as I've gone back three times now. Um, when a community that has so little goes so far out of their way to thank you, it does something to you that's just amazing. When a community can do something like this, and we go to their schools, and y'all, you know, if you haven't seen it, and I love the way Natalie put it, smelled it, you know, it's, it does something to you, and you get this perspective that just, it, it almost can't happen any other way. Um, other than to see the, the, the huge difference that happens there. And in so many ways, they're different. In so many ways, they're the same. Um, we're all God's children, and God is so bigger than any of us ever thought. Um, and my, my life continues to get expanded through these things. The part I wanted to share with you is um, uh, that Sunday morning, two days after we went into our trip, uh, we showed up for church in a, uh, I'm just going to be clear, um, I don't mean anything negative by this, but I just want to paint a clear picture. We showed up to a place that you and I probably wouldn't call a church. Um, it was a pole barn, literally, you know, about seven or eight poles around it, and um, a roof that was uh, just very small. There was a wall at the back or the front, if you're going to look at it, the front of the church, um, and, and that was it. That was basically it uh, to, this, to this structure. It would sit about 80 people. Uh, that were crammed in there if we were to do that. And we tested that later in the week when the bottom dropped out and the rain was everywhere. We packed 80 youth into that structure. Um, and God showed up for us in, our, in an amazing way. We started this week in that community with what we thought was only about 60 youth that were going to be a part of what we were doing, this Bible study thing. We had um, uh, upper 40s or so our first time. And I, I, kind of, I was trying to be realistic. And go, hey, you know, it, it would be great if half of those show up the next couple days. I mean, I know how teenagers are. Um, it would be great if we had 20 or 30. Like, that would be awesome. By the end of it, on Thursday, we had 86 teenagers that, that showed up. And 
and um, we, we blew the doors off of what even the mission organization thought was even in the community. Like, we sort of went, hey, there really are way more kids than you thought, you know. <laughs> Tell the next team. <laughs> They're going to show up. Um, which was so amazing. But we, that Sunday morning, we packed um, outside of this structure, on inside, <laughs> outside of the structure, close to 300 people showed up. Um, and as we were getting there, uh, the first three rows in the church underneath the, um, underneath the, the, the roof um, opened up for us, the chairs. The, everybody that was sitting in those first three rows stood up, went to the back, and they absolutely required that we go up there and sit and take their spots. And they stood the rest of the time, basically, around the edges. To do something like that was just really amazing and, and just so life-giving for us. And as they welcomed, and uh, we literally dwarfed them in that place. Um, it was a really amazing thing. The last thing I'll share with you, it would be the generosity of my own father. Um, my dad literally worked himself to death, um, to put it very clearly. Um, giving of himself 60, 70, I don't know, sometimes even 80 hours a week or so. I mean, he, he would work and work and work as a mechanic and just give to provide for my mom and I. Um, so that we could have a good life and we could we could survive and manage and that sort of thing And my dad said to me and because of that generosity he said to me I, I, I want to work so that you don't have to do this later on in life And it's not that there's anything wrong with that. That's just what my dad would say to me because God's got something bigger and greater and more amazing for you and in so many ways I'm here because of the sacrifice of my dad and that's just honest. That's truth um, Had he not done what he did the 15 years that he was alive in my life, um, that uh, I, I couldn't be here. I, there's no way that uh, he paved the way in so many ways for me. And I'm grateful for that, his generosity. I hope you have examples of God's generosity and the generosity of others in your life. And I want to challenge you even more in that. I hope you're being generous to other people uh, in your own life and paying things forward instead of paying things back. As we close, think about this. If someone sues you for something, Jesus says, do give them something better. If, if you're wronged, live like a servant. If someone needs something, see how you can help them. Instead of seeking to get somebody back, offer something out of generosity. Generosity is the thing that breaks the chains and sets us free. Jesus himself died out of generosity for us. Yeah, he, he died out of uh, an extreme love for us to, to break the curse of sin and, and to break that cycle. But in so many ways, Jesus brought us freedom, not just breaking chains, but freedom uh, to live the life that God would, would want us to live. A life of freedom, a life of joy and real, real joy in the midst of it all. So I want to ask you this as, as, we, uh, as we pray. What are those chains that you have in your life? As you saw those, those teenagers up here and, and uh, some of our adult leaders, what, what chains do you have in your own life that are, that are weighing you down, that are shackling you, that are binding you? And if you're honest with yourself, you may have some of those things still going on. I would encourage you the same way you saw in that skit. Choose to let Jesus take control and take those chains off of you. Break the power, break those chains, and then kneel in worship. As we close in prayer, as we close in song today, I invite you, if you want to come and pray, you can do that. Uh, but take this with you. Um, it doesn't end here in this place. I hope it encourages you and God uses it in your life later this week. Let's pray. God, thank you again for what you do. God, I thank you that you love us, that you care for us in the midst of, in spite of, regardless of who we are and what we do and the choices we make and uh, the crazy stuff that happens in our lives. So God, we pray that, uh, that you would guide us and speak to us in these moments. God, if there are chains and shackles that we have in our own life, places where we're not free, God, I pray that you would make us free, help us to submit to you, that we would go straight to you. God, that we would run willingly to your throne, to, to the foot of the cross, that we would say to you, God, I, I don't have it all figured out. I need help. I need your guidance. And God, that you would set us free. I know that you would do that, Lord. You're just asking for willing hearts and submission to come before you. So God, be with us as we close in this place today. Continue to minister to us and let this message keep going in our hearts as we leave from here today. God, we give it all to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.